No pressure on you, Mark. Um, there's a room full of expectation of how we're going to move ahead. But uh, Mark's going to share a little bit about what he's been doing in his role. A reminder that he's been involved with ACSI for 30 years. He's been leading his schools in a somewhat difficult environment. Um, and uh, hopefully he's going to share a little bit of that with us um, this morning. So it's, it's just been such a privilege having Mark around. So I'm going to pray for you, Mark, that uh, your wisdom will come shining through to us. Father, thank you once again for this man. Thank you, Lord, for what you've called him to. And, um, and as that, he's a, been obedient to that call, Father, he's grown from strength to strength. And I pray, Lord, that as he shares with us this morning, that he would be able to articulate that well. Father, give him a real sense of your peace right now. Uh, give him clarity of thought and the words to express that which he wants to. Lord, help us and just once again, just open our hearts for the last time to receive. Thank you for his willingness to be here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Now, for those who have been brave enough to stay around to actually hear a Canadian close the program, I've arranged for each one of you to have a Canadian passport, <laughs> a parka, and a snow shovel. <laughs> This has been absolutely wonderful for me. I'm so grateful for the people who have taken me in as family here. I really am. And that's what you've done. I haven't felt really like a stranger. Like someone. That's, that's just the way it is in God's family, isn't it? As I heard our brother speaking about... Uh, Issues here in the black community. Couldn't help but think of my brothers and sisters I work with all the time in Haiti and how their culture is uh, different than the culture here. Quite different. And the belief systems are very different. And, you know, I was once speaking to a team of uh, American uh, missionaries not missionaries, a mission group that came for a few weeks to Haiti. And they'd asked me to speak, which was in itself kind of odd. So I decided to tell them, you know, folks, we're not here to create Haitians who are basically American Christians in Haitian skins. That's not what this is about. We're here to give God's principles that apply in Haiti, in Canada, in United States, in South Africa, in every nation in the world. And I told my American colleagues what I tell my Haitian brothers and sisters. We all have a culture. And that's a great thing. That's part of the gift of creativity that God gave us, to be like him, in his image, creative. But we're a culture and the scriptures are in conflict. It's the culture that has to change, not the scriptures. And I need to tell you that there's not another region in ACSI that I'm aware of where the people have the courage to have a conference like this. Not one. I'm not buttering Sean up. But you, you need to know, this kind of creative Christian audacity is what we need in the Christian school movement. Thank you for being part of it. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, first about the kind of policies that we have in Canada. And note these are Canadian policies that, for now... <clears throat> fit with Canadian law. They are not necessarily transferable here. And they're based upon a couple of principles. Oh, it did. First, truth. God's truth doesn't change. God's truth does not evolve into something new. Jesus is not evolving. You see, 
the problem we've had in our own lives, our own countries, our own schools, isn't that we weren't keeping up with Jesus' evolution. The problem is, was, is that we have been operating in a way that did not match God's principles always. And so we need to change because God's principles are about wisdom and truth and love and they are unchanging principles. I mean, we learn lots of new science. We learn where we failed as individuals and churches. And you know, when we maybe feel guilty about things we've done wrong and we've injured others, we need to seek forgiveness. We need to go to God for forgiveness too. But we also need to understand we're not the only sinners in this Christian community. We are all sinners one way or another. And our only, our only hope the only thing that makes us one is Jesus Christ, not our good works or our failure of good works. Here are the sample policies I'm going to show you. They're not exciting and they're not very entertaining. They're just what we do for your information. First one is a statement of core family values. And these policies we urge all our schools to have in their handbooks. And here's the way we encourage it. We say, uh, if you have these policies in your handbook and you ever end up in court or human rights commit against in a human rights court, we will back you 100%. We will do fundraising, we will do whatever to support this because we've checked these policies and we believe that they are fair and just, true to scripture, and legally defendable, not that we'll win for sure. They're just defendable. Gender policy statement. And the third statement is a statement of affirmation for missional schools. In Canada, I'm sure it's the same here. Our Christian schools kind of are broken into two groups. One are confessional schools. You can only come to this school if your family is a Christian or a Christian of this denomination or you follow, you believe the school statement of faith. You can only come to school then. That's okay. Those are confessional schools. And we have those. And then we have missional schools, which say, Anybody's welcome to come. But you've got to realize this is what we're going to be teaching. And if it's not what you want in your school, then, you know, there are other schools. This is just who we are. Guess which one of those two has been under attack? The missional schools. In our human rights case that I talked about last, last time I spoke to you, it was a confessional school, and because it was a confessional school, that is, all the parents who enrolled agreed with the school's statement of faith. The judge ruled in favor of the school. If it had been an open enrollment school, it may have been a different story, because the Trinity Western University case hinged on whether or not Trinity Western allowed non-Christians to come or to the school or not. And because they allowed non-Christians to come, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled against them having a statement of behavior for their students and canceled their law school's right to uh, produce graduates who could practice in major provinces. So the principle in creating policies like this, and policies need to be kind of proactive. If you folks are in a position now, and I, from what I, I heard yesterday, 
not all legal details are hard and fast yet. There are things in the process. Be proactive with uh, political representatives, with your government. Be proactive by producing a, a suitable set of documents that schools can use and that you'll stand behind. So here's the scripture. Jesus says, behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Sort of, it's kind of an odd thing, you know. It's, it's a limited comparison. Because after you look at serpents, you think, whoa, I don't really want to be too much like a serpent. But Jesus is saying just in this one aspect. Now, imagine how he's doing this. I can picture in my mind, and this is, this is strictly a, a Kennedy fantasy. Jesus walking along, teaching people. And over there, he sees a snake. And the snake, as soon as it sees the people coming, it zips into its hole to escape. Good move, because people don't like snakes. And if it's stuck around, it could be dead. So it had a degree of wisdom. And as for innocent as doves, he's walking along, he sees where the snake's gone. Be wise as serpents. There's some doves in a tree. They're beautiful and they're innocent looking. And, uh, you know, doves are so lovely. When you sit out on the porch at our house, not this time of year, in the evening. And there are doves in the trees. And they've got this soothing coo sound. And they'll come down where we've got bird seed out and eat. And they're so, so trusting that uh, some of them don't last long. There are cats in the area. But, you know, sometimes we get this wrong in Christian circles. Instead of being innocent as, or wise as serpents and innocent as doves, we're kind of sometimes as, as dumb as pigeons and mean-spirited as, as a mamba. And that's not what God calls us to be. Wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Whoop. Wisely worded, legally vetted public policies offer a degree of protection from antagonistic individuals or groups. It's not a guarantee. But you need to start now if you don't have some policies that address current social issues. And you need to be wise about the wording and vet them with a good lawyer. Not just a lawyer who is morally good. A lawyer who is capable. Here's the sample statement that we have our schools put in all their parent handbooks and in their parent agreements so that no one will be confused about what we're going to teach. Because the worst thing you can do is surprise parents with something they find very offensive. First thing, all members of the board and administration and staff of the school believe that the Bible is the word of God and without error in all its teaching because of our understanding of the Old Testament and New Testament, our school teaches these values. Notice it did not say, because this is a public document that could end up in a court case. It did not say, this is the way it is. If you don't believe it, you're wrong. This is our understanding. First, that it is unacceptable for Christians to teach hatred against any group or individual. And that addresses the accusation that we sometimes get, which is usually false, that we're a bunch of haters because we disagree on some issues. No, we have a different opinion. In Canada, We've gone further down the road than you have, and I'm not boasting at all. Where tolerance, the new definition for tolerance, is the old definition for intolerance. 
where inclusiveness means we include everybody as long as you believe what we believe. And so, a concern for us is the possibility of just saying in the future, we believe that marriage is a heterosexual institution and that sexual intimacy belongs inside a heterosexual marriage between one person, one man and one woman. But we're going to say it because that's what the scriptures say. That's the truth part. Two, that human life begins at conception and that an unborn child at any stage of development is fully human and should be treated as such. Now, our brother who spoke just before me was talking about uh, what's happened in the States where a child can be in the process of being born aborted in Virginia and in New York State. What he didn't mention is that's already okay in Canada. But you know, it doesn't stop there. There's a philosophy behind all this. There's a worldview behind this. It isn't a matter of people saying, well, it's a woman's right to choose. No, there's a worldview that's much bigger than that. The worldview is espoused by Dr. Peter Singer, among others. He's a professor of ethics at Princeton University. You know, there's Princeton and Yale and Harvard, the big three universities in the States. He's the professor of ethics. And he says a child is not fully a person until he or she is at least six months old. And so to end his or her life before that, because the child is not able to think properly or react properly, that's, that's not murder, that's a woman's right. And on the other end, we've got euthanasia, where people's lives are being ended in the Netherlands as a prime example, but in Canada now. Not with their permission necessarily. So what you've got is what, you know, a, a more a modernized form of what Hitler called non-productive eaters. You can get rid of people who are non-productive eaters. That extramarital sexual intimacy is morally wrong. It doesn't say what kind of sexual intimacy. It just says extramarital is morally wrong. And that marriage is an exclusively heterosexual institution involving one man and one woman. And polygamy, you know, polygamy is not a part of our native culture in North America. But it is a growing reality. It always has been in the Mormon church, but it's a growing reality in our society in general. And uh, there's something else going on. Now, this one you won't believe, but trust me, it is absolutely true. When Mr. Obama said, doesn't matter who you love, you can marry that person. In California, a woman married herself. White dress, went through the ceremony with a mirror and a minister. She married herself. And you may be asking, I wonder how that's going. She says, it's wonderful. She never has fights. You know, it's... <laughs> The gender policy. This comes from our head office and it's been uh, altered slightly by our lawyer who is uh, one of the Christian men who leads cases at the Supreme Court for us. In recognition of a student's physical privacy rights and the needs to ensure student safety and maintain school discipline, this policy is en enacted to advise school site staff and administrators regarding their duties 
in relationship to students' use of restrooms, washrooms, locker rooms, showers, and other school facilities where students may be in a state of undress in the presence of other students. Definition, biological sex means the biological condition of being a male or female as determined at birth on physical differences or when necessary at the chromosomal level. I mean, this gets so complex, folks. Use of school facilities, notwithstanding any other board policy, student restrooms, locker rooms, and showers that are designed for one biological chromosomal sex shall only be used by members of that biological chromosomal sex. In any other school facility or setting where a student may be in a state of undress in the presence of others, change rooms, so on, school personnel shall provide separate private areas designated for students' uh, use by, uh, based on their biological chromosomal sex. So in other words, a boy can't say I'm really a girl because of the way I feel, and so I'm going to be in the girls' change room. And th this is a big deal in the States. There are, there are cases going through the courts, and it is it's pretty awful. Students that exclusively and consistently assert at school that their gender is different from their biological sex shall be provided with the best available accommodations that meet their needs but in no event shall, that act, shall ha, they have access to school, restrooms, locker rooms, showers of the opposite biological sex. Such accommodations may include, but are not limited to, access to a single stall restroom. And some of our schools have turned all of their student washrooms into single stall units with one door, you know, complete door, and no common area. Uh, where access using or control use of a faculty restroom, locker room, or shower. So that is the policy. Now here's a statement for missional schools because our lawyer said in Canada it is not out of the question to have student from a non-Christian family or a family that doesn't believe your statement of faith take you to court and say they have to make accommodations for us by not teaching their religious things to my child. And that's based on previous law in the past five years, previous court decisions. So here's what we're recommending. And by the way, we get a lot of non-Christian families in our schools, a lot. One school, one of our biggest schools, has about 60% families from the Sikh commun community, which is amazing. Why would they be coming to a Christian school? Because of the morality that we teach, because of the academic standards, so, and the discipline. So they want to come to our school. So the principal says to them, when they come for interviews to the parents, look at folks, we're going to be challenging your child to receive Christ. We don't force anybody to do that, but that's the challenge we have. And if, if that's really offensive to you, we respect that, but this isn't the right school. And so still, 60% come. And we get that right across Canada. And yet the families that are in Christian churches families who are not first-generation Christians, whose, whose roots go back generations in Canada, they don't want Christian schooling. They're happy with secular education. And it's tragic. And it's like, it's like the scripture, you know, where Jesus talks about the, the great man who's going to have a feast, and he invites all of the people who should want to come to come to the feast, and everybody's got an excuse. Oh, it's too expensive, too inconvenient. They don't have good hockey teams at the schools. And then the, the uh, founder of the feast says, go into the highway and the hedges. And so it would be quite appropriate to call some of our member schools Highway and Hedges Christian School. 
because there are so many kids from families that like the morality, that don't understand Christianity, but we've tried to explain, and they just want to come. And they come from all over the world, too. Since uh, the, uh, the election of Mr. Trump in the States, the number of students that are coming to Canada from other nations has skyrocketed, and the number that are going to the States has declined rapidly, too. So here it goes. School is biblically based religious organization that supports families who choose to give their children a Christian education based in the Christian worldview and the moral convictions in the statement of faith, statement of core family values. The school also welcomes students from families that do not hold these beliefs under the clear understanding that Every student will be taught all aspects of the school curriculum. No family will actively seek to alter or undermine the teachings of the school. Each student will be encouraged to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but no student will be compelled to do so. And then we get the a statement that the parents will sign. We at this school respect all parents, including those whose beliefs are contrary to ours, and we encourage those who strongly oppose these beliefs and values to seek a school for their children that's in keeping with their own convictions. And the parent signs, I confirm, that uh, we will support the school. Now, I thought this kind of fits in there because we've had to learn this the hard way too. How do you deal with antagonistic questions? especially from the press. And be aware, folks, that when newspaper writers or interviewers for the media want to talk to you, they have an agenda. Very few of them come to you just for information purposes. There are some. Some will come because they like your school and they want to be positive about it but others will have an agenda behind their questions. And their questions reveal their agenda. Sorry this is so dark. Sean will have the whole thing for you. Don't be surprised. Here, these are principles for us. Don't be surprised, hurt, or offended by hateful, false accusations. Don't be surprised. Attacks against Christians and Christian beliefs have been common throughout the past 2,000 years. It's true. In Canada, we see it all the time because we've got su we're such a minority. And uh, our social engineers have so much rejected us. Principle from Scripture. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on an account of the Son of Man. Don't shoot back, no matter how outrageous the provocation. So, one of our schools had this question in an a interview for a, may, a newspaper. Why do you hate gays? It's kind of a like, it's, it's sort of like a, have you stopped beating your wife question? You know? And the whole point was, he was convinced that because you believe the scriptures, you hate gays. And so make the excuses. Come on, come on. Fortunately, I'd given the principal of that school some advice on how to deal with that, and it worked out okay. Principal, do not repay anyone evil for evil, because we're believers. We can do things the world's way and repay evil for evil, but we're to do things God's way, and that's Romans 12, 17. Don't fear lies. You see, the point of some questioning 
is to get you on the defensive. And it's like a boxing match. There's a bigger, stronger opponent who's hitting you. And what he wants you to do is not defend yourself effectively, but to sort of cringe and go in the corner so he can really pummel you. So you have to, don't be afraid. The Lord's with you. Don't go on the defensive. Never say, but we're not haters. But we're not, you name it, ophobes. Because name-calling folks shows a lack of intellectual strength. Yeah. If you, if you reduce your discussion to simple name-calling, it shows you haven't got much to say. Attackers try to put believers on the defensive, so refuse to answer, refuse to answer false accusations with defensive responses. Say Christian convictions respectfully and without a hint of apology. We believe that God loves everyone, so hatred of any person is unacceptable for us. We also believe that God made his laws and life principles for our good, so that according to our understanding of Scripture, sexual intimacy of any kind and so on. Principle, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that's, you, that's in you. But do this with gentleness and respect. Don't answer quickly. Take time to think before responding and don't give one-word answers. If you're nervous about answering a question, you say, I'd like to get back to you on this interview. Let's schedule a time that's uh, mutually agreeable. No, no, I want the answer now. You're asking me for the interview. So I get to decide the grounds in which we have it, and when. Yeah, but I got a deadline. You're asking me. I will set the grounds. Principle, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Here's a, 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 a truth about newspapers from our dear friend Mark Twain. He said, if you don't read the newspapers, you're uninformed. And if you do read them, you're misinformed. <laughs> you don't have to say anything to the newspaper or the press or the, or the TV uh, interviewers. Especially if the accuser is with the media, we have a right to delay our response to a time convenient for us, or we can courteously choose not to respond at all. Remember that Jesus chose not to answer his accusers. The media and the public do not have a right to know. Well, yes, they do. How do you know that? They always tell us that. Well, they're wrong. They don't have a right to know. Number six, the more you say, the more potential ammunition you give to those who are predisposed against you. Nothing we say to the media or in a public forum is off the record. It's better to say less than more. And when we're nervous, we tend to say more. So there's a degree of self-control needed. During a crisis at your school, for example, for example, a criminal act by a student or teacher. Crisis at your school, you appoint only one person in the school to be the spokesperson, the public spokesperson. Only one. Anybody who wants to ask questions has to be directed to that one person. See, because what some, some reporters will do 
is they'll find out that their second cousin teaches at that school and they'll go and say, yeah, but what really happened? Give me the scoop on what, you know, it'll be confidential. It'll be off the record. It's never off the record. So one person represents the school. Anybody who asks a teacher, and, you, and I even include parents in this, about what happened, they are to say, thank you for your question. The spokesperson who will be answering questions on this issue is, and you can contact that person at. End of conversation. Yeah, yeah, but you, know, you must know something extra special. Here's the person to talk to. I'm not the person. Now we're going to go back to something else to end, because I hope it ties in with what we've been saying. You know, we've all heard some wonderful speakers and different points of view. But I'm gonna bring you back to the little image I had at the beginning of the piece of pottery that held treasure. And how easy it is for us to be attracted, to be preoccupied with the pot. I use that kind of an, as an excuse for me because I'm kind of an old crumbling pot. But the pot isn't the, isn't the important thing. It's whether or not the pot contains treasure. And the scripture that talks about we have this treasure in, in vessels of clay is referring to God's word, to the deep things of the Lord. And so beyond the pots that we've all enjoyed seeing, when we go away from here, we need to examine the treasure in the light of God's word. Jesus said something really remarkable. He said, no, this is Paul saying about Jesus. He said, uh, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. It's not all wisdom and knowledge because there's scientific knowledge. It's God's truth, but it's kind of a universal God's truth. And, uh, there's knowledge about history. Again, universal God's truth. But he says the treasures, the really important stuff, are hidden in Christ. Those treasures are what I hope you will find in some of this, the messages you've heard. And the way you tell is you hold them against in the light of Scripture. Are they in agreement with the whole counsel of the Word of God? I like the fact that it says the treasures are hidden. Hidden from whom? Hidden from people who do not recognize Jesus Christ as Lord and his unchanging word as authority. Those treasures are hidden from those people. And I'm not criticizing them. And you know, I'm not saying that we're better than them. Because you know what makes you and me different? Christ's blood shed for us. We're just like them, except Christ in his grace, in his love, shed his blood for us. And we said, Lord, we are, we are sinners. We need that. It's not about us. It's not about self-aggrandizement. It's about what you did for us. And if you're sitting here, folks, I say this with love to you, and you don't know Christ. Maybe you've been in religious circles a long time. I sure was. And you know how to do all the things and say, say all the right responses. And you've never really met the living Christ and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. My sins may not be of a sexual nature. We've been talking about that, but I've got sins. All of us do. And they're, they're weighing on me. 
They're affecting the way I live, the way I think. Will you please forgive them in Jesus' name? And he will. And something remarkable will happen to you. It's not about joining a church either. And the problem when you look at churches, <laughs> you say, man, that church is, is really bad. Well, what about your school? Anything wrong with your school? No, no, we got the perfect school, but we know what's wrong with all the others. And you know, the, the thing is, if I ever found a perfect church, I don't think they'd let me in. Because I still have things that need cleaning up in my life that are not right. Thank God he's changed me. You know, sometimes when I have my devotions, I say, Lord, I remember what a, what a jerk I was about some things. How egotistical I was. And the only reason I'm any different than that now is because you've taught me some things. I've got lots to learn yet. But you've taught me some things when I trusted your word. And some of those things I wouldn't have believed a long time ago when I was first a Christian. Anyway, the things that are killing us in Christian schools, he who's silent when he ought to have spoken is perceived to agree, or more simply, silence implies consent. In Canadian Christian uh, community, they don't like to talk about issues like you're talking about here. But I raise them in our conventions. I don't raise them as effectively as Sean has. In the United States, they won't even mention the topics. And I know that because I've gone to leaders and said, hey, how about this? How about we talk? No, you know, that's going to offend some people. Do you know how, many, how often Jesus offended people? He didn't, that wasn't his goal. He told the truth in love to set people free. But some people decided to be offended. Look at the Gospel of John if you want to see how many times people were offended. The reality is, no matter how kindly and lovingly we present our position, some people will be offended. But that doesn't give us an excuse to present things in an obnoxious or hateful way. See this place? Does anybody know what that is? About 1988, I told you I was in Russia. And we were training Russian teachers in how to teach the Bible. One of our translators was a gentleman named Peter. Peter and uh, a few of us went for a walk one evening in Petrozavosk city. And we're chatting at this and that, and it's very pleasant. And then Peter gets serious. Because I asked him about a city named Chernobyl. 1986, there was a nuclear disaster there in Chernobyl. The nuclear power plant exploded. And nuclear waste was spread for, I mean, there was some of it that made it to Canada. It was huge. You know what the word Chernobyl means by an interesting coincidence? Wormwood. Think of the verse of prophecy in scripture that talks about this destructive star called Wormwood. And I, I just wonder, is this what you meant, Lord? So I asked Peter about it, and he said, uh, this was a couple of years after the disaster. I said, Peter, that must have been awful. You must have had to evacuate your children right away. And he said, no. He said, the government would not tell us about the accident. All we knew was that our children were getting sick. And so I make myself obnoxious in Canada sometimes by saying when children are not given the privilege of learning God's truth in school, 
the results is the results will be they will suffer there will be consequences in the long run and there are that's chernobyl we must always take sides neutrality helps the oppressor never the victim silence encourages the tormentor never the tormented and here we are talking about Christian schools and the importance of advancing Christian education, advancing God's kingdoms through Christian education. You know, when ACSI first came out with their theme, Stronger Together, I asked them if we could uh, leave it out in Eastern Canada. Because I said, to me, that's not the theme I want to have. It's not that we're stronger together, so the more schools we get, the better off we are somehow. Because thats I don't think that's correct. I think what's true is we are advancing God's kingdom through Christian education. Not through ACSI alone, but through Christian education. And it's not about only... Training up kids in God's way. Of course it's that. That's essentially part of it. But the end is advancing God's kingdom. The seek ye first is advancing God's kingdom. And that means making some things secondary. And maybe third and fourth and fifth. Things like our sports program. Things like prestige. Things like how much money we have. Do you notice what Jesus was tempted with in the wilderness? He was given three temptations. One was appetite. The second was power. If you, you can have power over these cities. The third was prestige. Jump from the heights of the, of the temple and the angels will catch you on your way down. No one's going to crucify someone who does that. Prestige. Does it really matter if the world thinks we're wonderful as opposed to God thinking we're faithful? Whoop. When a movement doesn't move, and we have to be aware in Christian schools, worldwide of this reality. The movement is moving here. It's moving in Haiti, in some places, but in some places, something's going on. Here's, here's a picture of the Allied landing at Anzio. Anzio, this is during the Second World War. Anzio is a, a beach in Italy. Nazi forces had control of all Italy. And the Allies sent three groups, Canadians, Americans, and British, to land at Anzio and try to fight their way through Italy. Landing time comes, and the general in charge is very nervous, but he sends the troops ashore anyway. There is no opposition. They land on the beach, and they set up their, their tents and all the commissariat stuff on the beach, and it's great. Oh. You know, it reminds me of when we, were, we first got going with Christian schools how quickly they grew and how relatively small the problems were. And uh, the general kind of was sitting there doing nothing. And one of his scouts came to him and said, General, do you want us to go find out where the Nazi troops are? Okay, you go ahead. Take a jeep, you and two other people. So three guys get in a jeep. They drive 57 miles inland to the city of Rome. 57 kilometers, sorry, inland to the city of Rome. Not an enemy soldier in sight. The Nazi forces had evacuated Rome and called it an open city. In other words, 
Come take it. And so the scouts went back to the general and they said, hey, we can, we can move all the way to Rome. There's no opposition. And the general said, this might be a trap. You know, we made it this far and we're safe and we can dig in and I don't think we better move forward. The opposing general looked at this and he couldn't believe it. <laughs> but gradually he filled that empty space. And that led to one of the most bloody battles of World War II on the beach at Anzio. Because an advance group didn't advance. A movement didn't move. And Churchill said, we thought we were turning loose a wildcat on the beaches of Italy, only to discover it was a beached whale. The Christian school movement needs to move. We need to move ahead. And the thing we, we, that perhaps is our greatest danger is not those who oppose us immediately. It's our own comfort in the position where we are now. It's our own saying, well, our school is fine. We don't need to work with you other schools. You can come and see how to become a good school. Folks, if it's just about a bunch of schools, that's fine. But if, if this is a movement of God, we've got to move. That's why this conference is so incredibly important. It is moving God's kingdom forward. And you know, people are saying, yeah, but if it was, real, if it was the real thing, we'd be, we would, wouldn't be able to hold it in this room. There'd be so many people that would be involved because there's so many Christian schools. No, no. You know how God works? through small groups where people are faithful and not powerful, but faithful. And then gradually people join. Watch, consider this. You know, the problem with me moving around is that I leave stuff. The power of a faithful few. Can you imagine anything more ridiculous than the way Gideon won his battle? It's just truly ridiculous. Ram horn and a pot and a, a torch and only a handful of men. Because God kept saying to him, you got too many men, Gideon, get rid of some of them. Those ones aren't really keen on the fight, get rid of them. How about Joshua and Caleb in the promised land? 12 scouts. Two said we can go in. The rest said, ooh, it's scary. It's full of giants. Let's stay here where it's comfortable. There's no staying here in our societies these days. The Christian school movement needs to advance. And the, another scripture that will help us understand that, maybe. You know the scripture that says, and the gates of how do gates prevail? Gates don't attack. Do they? Do gates attack? Gates prevail when nobody confronts them, when nobody attacks them. Now, I'm talking spiritual warfare here. I'm not talking about throwing things at people or being hateful or anything like that. I'm talking spiritual warfare. I'm talking advancing God's kingdom in his way. I love this quote from George Bernard Shaw, who was not a Christian but who was right about a lot of things. Reasonable people adapt themselves to the world. Unreasonable people attempt to adapt the world to themselves. All progress, therefore, depends on unreasonable people. You know, I think we've got some unreasonable people here. Because faith isn't really all that reasonable when it comes to moving out on issues when it comes to advancing the 
kingdom of God is still advancing. The question for you and for me is, may the Lord grant us the faith and courage and love to be part of the advance. How awful to be one of the people who are going to fight for Gideon and to be told, well, you're not really, your heart's really not in it, so you can come later. No, Lord, I want to be in the advance. I want to see your kingdom move forward through Christian education. And in order to do that, I need to understand the issues of the day. Understand how you speak to them in your word so that we can advance with love, compassion, and truth. That's what I wanted to share with you. I'm going to let everybody out early. Where's Sean go? There he is. Yeah, I think I'm going to let everybody out early. No, I can't. Everybody's got to sit here quietly, their hands neatly folded on their desk. Sorry? I'm done. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Mark. Um, are there any questions for Mark? S related to anything that he's mentioned, especially your schools, some of those policies, possibly? You're looking at me and say, Sean, when are you going to give me the policies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll work with Mark and see what he does. It sure. is a question. Thank you, Mark, for the inspiration. Uh, it's, it's not even a question, it's, it's, it's a request of getting the three statements that you have mentioned. Yes. The statement of core family values, yes. gender policy statement, and statement of affirmation for missional um, schools. I'll make sure you get them and have them available. Any other questions? Good. We have ordered lunch a little bit earlier, um, but you're not allowed to go yet because the, the most important speaker is still coming. Uh, but can I, can I challenge you again? Just, um, Matt, why don't you put on a, a little bit of music? Just two minutes. I need to set my computer up. What are you going to take away? Write it down because you're going to take it away and you're going to hit the traffic and your mind's going to go back to where you've come from. So just on your own, write one sentence down, whatever it is. What are you taking away? Away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the